Gauguin used reality only as a pretext for what Fénéant called distanced creations. By the late 1880s, these artists started to abandon the attempt to engage with modernity in the uncertain form of the city. They left Paris for regions and cultures in which they were tourists. Tourists travel to places where the customs of the people can be absorbed as sights, as experiences of the different and the new. The avant-garde artists went to a prosperous, developing Brittany but imagined it as primitive, mystic, and strange. In August 1888, Bernard painted Breton women in a meadow. It depicts the display and leisure of a Breton Sunday outing, and it is clearly a direct response to Seurat's Grand Jatte. but it is very different. Bernard emphasizes the flatness of the picture surface. He does not use traditional perspective and he makes no attempt at naturalism. Instead, he used the example of Japanese prints and medieval stained glass to compose a picture that is only held together by its own invented order of marks and colors on a flat surface. As a result of such stylization, we have no access to or empathy with the Breton people depicted. We need to think carefully about what it means to medievalize a 19th century Breton peasant or to transform Brittany into Japan. When Van Gogh saw the painting, he made a copy of it and he called it a Sunday afternoon in the meadow thus directly recalling Seurat's title. Within a few weeks of seeing Bernard's painting, Gauguin produced his bid for leadership of the avant-garde. In vision after the sermon, Gauguin painted a red field in which pious women vividly imagine a scene described to them in a sermon they have just heard about Jacob wrestling with an angel. It is another distanced creation. In his invention of the subject matter, Gauguin draws on contemporary tourist myths of a medieval and mystical Brittany. And the painting relies for its meaning on a city dweller's fantasy of the superstitious piety of peasant women. Van Gogh also left Paris after only two years in the capital and settled in Provence in the south of France. He had come to believe that the renaissance of modern art would only take place away from the city, symbol of a decadent and diseased society. But he also wanted to keep in touch with developments in the avant-garde. He invited Gauguin to visit him and both artists painted from the same subjects. Gauguin painted the scene in Arles as a tapestry of saturated, flat colors and shapes. He encouraged Van Gogh to move away from naturalism and impressionism and to experiment radically with color and perspective. Van Gogh was brought up in the country, in Holland. The landscape of the south of France was unfamiliar to him. He was a stranger, a tourist down here. And this was another country. Like many Northern Europeans, he imagined the Mediterranean to be an exotic, fiery world. And that's what he made it. He painted its people and their agriculture in landscapes drawn not only from what he saw around him, but from Japanese prints and even from etchings by Rembrandt. Here, he said, he was seeking his Japan. In other words, a world of the imagination. And here he found it.
In his collection of Japanese prints, Van Gogh saw a beautiful, sun-filled, harmonious world, which he imposed on the landscapes of Provence. The prints themselves gave him confidence to use color more brilliantly and in a more arbitrary way. Yet unlike Gauguin and Bernard, he never really understood the implications of the prints in terms of surface and flatness. His surfaces are thick encrustations of paint, but they always refer often vividly to the quality and texture, shape and perspective of what he painted. He painted himself at this time as a workmanly Japanese painter. He wrote to Gauguin, I have aimed at the character of a simple monk worshipping the eternal Buddha. Eventually, suffering from epilepsy and considered mad by many of the people who came into contact with him, Van Gogh was confined in the sanatorium here at Saint-Rémy near Arles. From his window, he could look out on the weird, rocky outcrops of the Alpi Mountains. And in June 1889, that view inspired one of his most famous paintings. The painting is Starry Night. Starry Night was an attempt to make a modern religious art. Van Gogh was suspicious, however, of the Catholic undertones of Bernard's and Gauguin's religious themes. Here, he uses typically Protestant nature symbolism, suns and stars and trees striving upwards towards the heavens. Incorporating a cypress tree so characteristic of Provence, the painting nevertheless has a Dutch church and Dutch cottages. Van Gogh painted Starry Night using modern colour theory. The complementary pair of yellow for light and blue for darkness translated the black and white opposition of religious pictures of divine illumination, such as Rembrandt's print of the Annunciation to the Shepherds. And it was also typical of Dutch 17th century woodcuts of celestial revelations. Unfortunately for Van Gogh, Neither Bernard nor Gauguin recognized this work as a reply to theirs. It was seen simply as a somewhat overstylized village in the moonlight. Paul Cézanne also lived and worked in Provence. With Seurat, Cézanne was the most influential figure of this generation. He had had a decisive contact with the Impressionists in the 1870s, but he left Paris and went home to the family estate in Provence. There, for the rest of his life, he painted and repainted the landscapes where he had spent his boyhood. Cézanne was not a tourist. He was therefore quite different from all the other artists we've discussed so far. Cézanne alone remained faithful to the Impressionist program of open-air painting, an art based on direct observation of the physical world. Day after day, for almost 30 years, he set himself to find an answer to this question. Could he make a new art based entirely on what he called his petit sensation? Petit sensation was one of Cézanne's key concepts. Sensation in French has two meanings. It refers both to physical perceptions and also to human feelings. 